I want to thank everybody for coming online tonight with us. I'm here in the museum at the American Writers Museum, which uh, we're hoping you may be able to visit again in the next month or so from what we've heard from the mayor's office. But fingers crossed, we'll see what, what that brings. So for those of you who are in Chicago or potentially coming to Chicago, we hope you'll have a chance to come visit us um, sometime this summer um, with socially distanced rules and other things in place. Tonight, uh, we have a special guest. Uh, Dr. Manisha Sinha, uh, who actually visited the museum uh, back in 2018 when we had our Frederick Douglass exhibit up. Um, and uh, we thought it would be great to have her back here today uh, because um, we launched a new microsite today. Uh, similar to our My America uh, microsite that we launched about a month ago, we've now launched uh, www fd-agitator.org for Frederick Douglass Agitator. Um, and it has the content of the exhibit that we had here behind me in our writer's room between June of 2019 and, or 2017, or 2018, sorry, and June of 2019. Um, so uh, our guest tonight, uh, Dr. Uh, Manisha Sinha, is the James L. and Shirley A. Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut, a leading authority on the history of slavery and abolition and the Civil War and Reconstruction. She was born in India, received her PhD from Columbia University where her dissertation was nominated for the Bancroft Prize. She's the author of The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, Politics and Ideology in Antebellum, South Carolina, which was named one of the 10 best books on slavery by Politico in 2015 and was recently featured in the New York Times 1619 project. Um, her multiple award-winning second monograph, The Slave's Cause, A History of Abolition, was long listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction, was named the Book of the Week by the Times Higher Education to coincide with its UK publication, and was one of the three great history books of 2016, according to Bloomberg News, as well as winning the 2017 Frederick Douglass Book Prize. It's also available for sale um, from our bookselling partner, Seminary Co-op. A link to buy the book is up in the chat window as well. I encourage you to click on that if you have not read the book. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, so please help me in welcoming Dr. Manisha Sinha. Um, so she's going to pop up on the screen in a, in a second or two here to join us. And um, we're going to talk for a little while. And as we do our Q&A together, if you have questions that you think you might want to ask um, after we've talked for a little while, I would encourage you to um, post them in the Q&A section. So if you look down below, you'll see a section that says Q&A. Just click on that button, type in questions that you and I have. And Dr. Sinha, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're excited that you're here. Um, you know, I wanted to thank you. Uh, you were back here in 2018, as I mentioned, uh, for when we had our Frederick Douglass exhibit. Um, and uh, we just launched that online. So we're excited about that. And we're excited that you could join us tonight. Um, I'm going to jump into some questions about your book, uh, which I enjoyed thoroughly. Um, but it's a, it's a huge book. It, it's, it's looking at a gigantic topic, 100 years of history, really, at least more um, related to abolition as you start as early as 1720 um, with kind of the precursors to what we think of as the abolition movement. Um, and as a writer's museum, I'm compelled to ask you about process that went into trying to tackle a project as large as this. You know, first off, I'm kind of interested in what compelled you to want to tell this particular story of abolition um, and that the focus that you brought to it. Well, you know, when I started writing this book, um, I was unsatisfied with the way in which abolitionists had been portrayed both in popular culture, but also in academic histories of the abolition movement. Um, and I decided I would write a book on African American abolitionists in particular. And I realized that there had been many books written on black abolitionists, on women in the movement, um, but that uh, no one had really placed them in the movement as a whole to mm -hmm. uncover their significance. Uh, I also realized that one could not just look at the conventional period uh, when it comes to studying abolition, which is the antebellum period. Right. Um, just 30 years or so before the Civil War. So that's how it became a, a bigger project. I went right back to the revolutionary era to a look at some early abolitionists because most of the abolitionists in the 19th century talked about them as having inspired them. So the book just kept growing, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, it became uh, this sort of new comprehensive history 
um, a hundred year history of abolition, looking at both the first wave in the 18th century and then uh, at the second wave of abolitionists uh, just before the Civil War. Yeah, and I, I mean, I was kind of fascinated the way you, you start off with, you know, um, a re, you know, slaves uprising on a ship um, mm-hmm. and literally fighting back, you know, is, is really that first part in this notion that there were, you know, it's the integration of everybody involved in the movement. I think that's so fascinating. Um, as you said, we tend to hear the stories of freed slaves and, and their struggles, and we tend to talk about the abolitionists like um, the garrisons and others as another group, sort of like the, the white moderate liberals who are over here preaching about something versus those who are living it, but not the integration. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, it must have taken you quite a while to do all this research. I'm curious how long of a project was this for you? It was a very long project. It took me 10 years. Uh, it took me 10 years to research and write this book. Uh, in the last few years, I literally spent just sort of refining it and shortening it. And even though it's a, it's sort of a big book, Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nearly 150 pages of, of footnotes so right. <laughs> it, it's it, you know it looks bigger than you know if you want you can avoid the footnotes and just read the uh, the text um, but you know I want to go back to the point that you made early on about how I began with a shipboard rebellion in yeah. the African slave trade and one of the reasons I did that was uh, not just to center African Americans in the story of abolition but to center slave resistance Um, in the story of abolition. And we we can see this with, you know, not just slave rebellions, uh, but also with the ways in which fugitive slaves like Douglas uh, ultimately join the movement and come to lead it and define some of its tactics and ideas. Um, And I was unsatisfied with the ways in which people had sort of compartmentalized the story. Um, So if you read a white abolitionist talking about the Haitian revolution or about uh, a particular slave rebellion in the Caribbean or Nat Turner's rebellion, Mm -hmm. uh, you you would not get a sense uh, that uh, that somehow these moments were very much part of the movement, at least contemporary saw it that way. Um, So even much of the literature that had been written on slave rebellions and resistance was separate from the story of abolition. And I felt it was really important not just to integrate African-Americans back into the movement, but to integrate stories of black resistance back into the history of abolition. Yeah, yeah, it was, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, and I'm forgetting the name, the, um, the captain of a ship, of his own ship, an African-American former slave who um, starts a movement for going back to uh, colonizing in Africa or setting up a, a, you know, an emigration point. Yes, that was Paul Cuffey. Uh, He was a black Quaker sea captain uh, from Massachusetts. And, um, you know, he was very interested in the idea of starting a kind of a back to Africa immigration movement. And his whole purpose was to found a modern black nation Mm -hmm. uh, where African Americans uh, could have um, political equality and citizenship, which he did not see happening in the new slaveholding republic. And this was a little different than the colonization movement that mm-hmm. arose later on and that was mainly led by prominent white politicians yeah. uh, and clergymen who, who literally just wanted to get rid of the black population in the United States, especially the free black population, but retain Uh, the enslaved population. Uh, Paul Cuffey's plan was to actually found a black nation and also as a way to actually end slavery uh, rather than perpetuate it in the United States. Yeah, and I I, think it's interesting that um, you mentioned that he had his entire crew was African-American. You know, like he had this entire ship crew that he brought over with him, that it was really a movement of African-Americans trying to find their own nation. And uh, it was really interesting and not something that I was familiar with. Um, one of the things you mentioned early on in the book um, and that comes up obviously throughout as you talk about different pamphlets and different books and different narratives um, is that you, you write that abolitionists were wordsmiths. Um, that what they lacked in power, they kind of made up for in their written materials and the preponderance of their written materials. Can you talk a little bit about how important the written word was to abolition? Absolutely. Abolitionist print culture is so important because that was the one weapon they had 
in order to uh, influence public opinion and convert people on the subject of slavery. Because as far as uh, the sort of national political arena was concerned, there was a sort of an understanding that as long as you had this union with Southern slaveholders, uh, that one would not bring up the issue of slavery, that somehow it was threatening to this union and to the compromises, the constitutional compromises made over the issue of slavery. Uh, so abolitionist print culture became a way uh, in which to sort of disseminate their ideas. And the print culture was fairly democratic in the sense that you could disseminate this literature through the United States Postal Service <laughs> fairly cheaply. This uh -huh. is why the U U.S. Postal Service is so important, such an important institution for our democracy. Um, and you could have women and African-Americans participate in it, in, in this print culture on an equal basis, even though they were denied uh, the formal rights of citizenship uh, mm -hmm. in the formal public arena. And so it, it was extremely important. And what was important, what was interesting for me to see was the emergence of a sort of a modern radical social movement with you know, modern means of communication, pamphlets, newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, they have this sort of old fashioned moralizing um, sort of idea too with you know, basic Christian precepts of do unto others, et cetera. But you can see the emergence of a quintessential uh, modern radical American movement. And the fact that it was interracial and the fact that women played such an important role in it, um, you know, was really interesting to me. But yes, uh, print culture was extremely important. They left a, a, a very interesting archive, the abolitionists. Um, there's music, there's theater, uh, there's material culture. Uh, and as a historian, I felt that I was already trespassing on, uh, you know, the turf uh, usually of literary scholars by, by really uh, trying to understand uh, a lot of the literature that they produced. Uh, and I didn't perhaps do justice to these other sources. Uh, it's a huge, it's a complicated archive, but I know people have worked on it and have continued to, will continue to work on it. But, but yes, I, I was looking at these sources and, and, and a lot of historians would tell me, well, you know, this is, this is just literature. How is this a historical source? Yeah. And I had to <laughs> convince them that, that this, is, this was important in terms of understanding the abolition movement. Yeah, well, when it comes to the mission of our institution, you know, part of the reason we had that exhibit on Douglas was because of the notion that it's the prime example of the power of of, lit of literacy, of, of writing, of, and of written literacy. You know, it's not just the notion that he could learn to read, but the notion that then he could write and communicate um, that allowed him to move a nation. Um, so, you know, I, I totally agree with you on the importance of it from a historical perspective. It isn't just literature. Um, I, I, on a side note, if you had, you know, three or four of the writers that came out of it, you know, maybe besides Douglas, um, who do you think in their era had the most impact through their written works, whether they were books or pamphlets or newspapers? I mean, who were some of the other written sources? I would definitely say Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison and his liberator. Uh, you know, Garrison was uh, a master at, um, at sort of uh, making that polemical argument against slavery. And it was so important for him uh, to sort of take those, uh, what was seen at that time, extreme and radical positions, but to us uh, appears as, as the, the humane position and the logical position and the most moral position to take at the time. Uh, but, but just reading The Liberator from page to page, uh, from 1831 right down to 1865 till he, wind up, he wound up with the newspaper was, was eye-opening for me because all I had read about Garrison were caricatures and except for one really very good biography, not by a historian, but by an independent writer, Henry Mayer, All on Fire, uh, I found most of the, the, the views of Garrison's to be, to be caricatures, especially in history books. Uh, very influenced, I think, by a whole group of revisionist Southern historians of the Civil War period. Um, and so I really enjoyed reading his uh, essays, and I would recommend them to anyone. Um, and then I, I really enjoyed reading the female, the women abolitionists. Um, their uh, view of uh, abolition 
as part of a broader human rights project that would also include women's rights uh, was eye opening for me. So you said four, but I would, I'll name four women because they're so (laughs) many, right? Uh, Rumki sisters, certainly, Sarah and Angelina, their work, um, Lydia Maria Child, uh, some of her essays and, and novels. Um, and then Maria Stewart and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, not very well known, uh, but black women abolitionists who, who wrote and spoke um, for abolition. And Harper was an accomplished poet too. Um, so, I, you know, it, different genres. You know, there were, there's nonfiction, there's the polemical essay, there were novels, there were poetry. Um, I, I really did think that those were the ones that, that really spoke to me. And then I loved reading Charles Sumner's speeches and all his mm. letters, uh, because he was just so erudite. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I just loved tracing all his illusions. Uh, Americans didn't get him. You know, they go, oh, God, this man is so pretentious. Why is he so learned? Uh, <laughs> but if you are a historian or a writer, you could really appreciate uh, his speeches and, uh, you know, even his, his loyally briefs. Uh, for de- desegregation of the Boston school system, which was actually studied by the NAACP lawyers at Thurgood Marshall uh, yeah. in Brown v. Board of Education. So these, these words were very effective too uh, for a long time after he was gone. Um, so those, those were my, my, I would say my, my favorites. And then of course, uh, Douglas, uh, there were other militant black abolitionists who didn't write that much, but who wrote that one extremely influential pamphlet. So David Walker's appeal to the colored citizens of the world. Uh, You could literally hear him because of the ways in which he capitalizes and punctuates the text. You can, when you're reading it, you feel as if you're, you're hearing him. Uh, You're hearing his, 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 his his anger, his, his frustration at uh, being a black man in a slaveholding republic. Uh, similarly with Henry Highland Garnett's Address to the Slaves. Um, these are iconic texts, but they, you know, and Garnett wrote and spoke more than that too. But um, unlike Douglas or Garrison, who consistent and Sumner who consistently wrote over a long period of time that they have a, they have an oeuvre that you can unpack. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I found them really. So you can see that I find it very difficult to contain myself when it comes to, to just like pinpoint four or five, but these were my favorites, I would say, yeah. Okay, well, that's that's great. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'm I'm curious about this kind of myth, and you mentioned it as kind of the Southern revisionist, but the um, this preconceived notion we might have of what the abolitionist movement uh, was or what we might think of it. What do you what do you see as kind of the preconceived notion of the general public, modern general public today, of what abolitionists were versus what they really were? So in, in popular culture, I would say uh, abolitionists are often seen as northern white middle class men and women who just took up the cause of the slave. Sometimes they are portrayed as saintly. Sometimes they are portrayed as hypocritical because what did they really know about slavery sitting up in the north, right? Uh, and again, a very ahistorical view of the movement as a whole uh, because you know many of them, like Garrison, you know he was. Um, an indentured servant virtually. He was a very poor apprentice and poor and, and, and an orphan apprentice to hard labor as a child. Uh, you know, many of these white abolitionists were hardly, uh, you know, what we would call bourgeois by any standard, even yeah. the women, and they, and, and, and they devoted their lives uh, to, to the movement. So most of them were constantly in need for funds. Um, and uh, they were very much in close contact with both free African Americans and with le- fugitive slaves uh, who came up north and joined the movement. And many of their ideas, you know, many of the things that Garrison said and did sounded so radical. But then if you look at some of these militant black abolitionists in the 1820s who preceded him, you can see where he got many of his ideas from. And he openly says that. So in the first issues of The Liberator, he has either he or somebody, and I have a feeling it could have been him, reviews David Walker's pamphlet in in, in not just one review, but four or five. You can see him being very influenced uh, 
uh, by militant black abolitionism. So the interracialism of the movement gets completely lost. Uh, right. And many times, uh, you know, we don't even investigate what white abolitionists are saying at that time about their relationships with African Americans. Uh, so I found that I had to really dive deep uh, into the archives and, and do a lot of primary research. I found I could not rely sometimes on books that repeated the same misconceptions again and again, uh, and that I really had to unpack those stories on my own. Yeah. Um, so I would say that is the, the misconception. We forget that this was a radical interracial movement made up of ordinary men and women, black and white, uh, and, and not some sort of northern white middle class saints removed from, or armchair moralists removed from um, the horrors of slavery, which is the way, in fact, that most of their critics and, and slaveholders portrayed them as. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and, and in truth, some of them are literally putting their lives in danger because of the positions that they're taking and, and because of some of the work that they did. Um, so yeah, from, from, it, it was really interesting to kind of see that, you know, because I think I walked into it with the same preconceived notion of this idea of the, of the white liberal sitting up in the North, just proselytizing about, this is a bad thing and you all should do something about it, but I don't want to give up my creature comforts. But then, as you said, most of these people did give up their creature comforts if they even had any, and they, they spent their entire life you know, I mean, when you mentioned you know, um, Garrison's The Liberator, he shuts it down in 65, I think you said, you know, kind of at the end of the war, um, because he feels like, well, I'm done. But of course, there's still more work to do. But but he's been doing it for 40 years mm -hmm. or almost at that point. So, you know, the exhaustion of every day of his life. Absolutely. And his wife is very ill at that point, too. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a sense that somehow Garrison thought that the abolitionist project was achieved with emancipation, that he actually did not support the fight for black citizenship. And that's a misconception mm -hmm. uh, because he continues to write. Yeah. He's not running the liberator because he thinks that's it. And he thinks the American Anti-Slavery Society has fought for abolition, but he really re realizes that the center of gravity in terms of effective political change has moved from this radical social movement uh, to the halls of government at this point, which yeah. is ironic because he was not a political abolitionist. Uh, he's a big supporter of Lincoln. He's a big supporter of the Republican Party uh, when uh, some abolitionists think that, you know, they should ditch Lincoln for someone more radical. He says, absolutely not. We, we need to stand united because this is the point where slaveholders are going to try and come back. Um, so he continues to fight for, for, but not in the ways in which he thought was needed, uh, a radical agitational movement uh, yeah. for abolition. Yeah. Um, you, you bring this up, and, and so I was going to kind of jump, um, you know, the, the, the issue of, you know, Garrison and Douglas in the beginning, you know, when Douglas uh, is, is a young um, man who has gotten himself freed from slavery um, mm -hmm. and uh, becomes a speaker and Garrison meets him and then they become very tightly connected mm -hmm. for a long period of time working together. And so Douglas is more or less a Garrisonian at that point. And then when he goes to uh, England, um, he kind of meets other people and, and Douglas becomes a political abolitionist. Um, and and what I find interesting about this is that the, the division between the two really seems to be on a reading of the Constitution. So if you look at a written document again, um, it, Garrison is reading the document as, and his disciples, as something that needs to go away, that it is inherently flawed and evil because it was built on the back of slavery. And Douglas is with him there, but then comes back and falls in with the political uh, um, uh, abolitionists that you mentioned who are more focused on changing government. Can you talk in more depth than I can about this division and why they separate and that kind of thing? Um, and again, you know, the, the garrison Douglas split is really interesting uh, and has always been portrayed as merely a, a racial split. And I think that's just too simple because yeah. there were many black abolitionists who remained Garrisonians. And there were many white abolitionists who were political abolitionists, too simplistic. Um, mm -hmm. What was interesting is that after Gar uh, Douglas comes back from his triumphant tour, uh, 
of uh, Britain. And at that point, he's still a Garrisonian. And his stewards are really arranged by the Garrisonians, mainly by British Garrisonians. And he's, you know, moving around them, uh, around in, in, in England, 18 months, I think he spends lecturing yeah. in England. Uh, and he's sent there mainly because his narrative is out and people are nervous that, in fact, uh, the, his former owner will try and, um, you know, try and recapture him. Um, and uh, when he raises money to buy his freedom, a lot of Garrisonians criticize him because they think it's hypocritical for him uh, to acknowledge uh, the right to property in human beings. But Garrison defends him. He calls yeah. it ransom. He says it's like paying a kidnapper. You know, Douglas is too valuable to our movement uh, to lose. Uh, so the break really comes after Douglas comes back uh, to the United States and he moves to upstate New York. And upstate New York is a hotbed of political abolitionism, both black and white. Uh, it's, it's the center of strength for the Liberty Party, which is an abolitionist political party. Garrison does not believe in voting. He, he, by the 1840s, says no compromise on slavery, no union with slaveholders. He thinks the Constitution is an evil bargain. Uh, it is a bargain uh, with slaveholders and compromises on slavery. Um, this notion that it is a, you know, an agreement with hell, a covenant with death, that's a biblical uh, term. And Garrison uses that to condemn the U.S. Constitution, the compromises over slavery. Interestingly enough, I found in my research that he got this actually from a black abolitionist, mm -hmm. W.C. Pennington, who had married Douglas when he uh, fled slavery. But to go back to this issue of the Constitution, I, by the time Douglas moves to upstate New York and begins his own newspaper, The North Star, um, yeah. And uh, the North Star uh, is, uh, the Garrisonians are wondering why is he starting a newspaper when Garrison already has one. So there's a little bit of conflict over that issue. Can the abolition movement sustain a separate newspaper? Uh, and by the 1850s, uh, Garrison, uh, Douglas gets a huge infusion of funds from a Liberty Party politician, Garrett, Garrett Smith, in upstate New York. Yeah. Uh, and he is able to maintain the North Star. But in the 1850s, the situation is also changing. And Douglas sees that. You know, you see, he sees the controversies over slavery. It's not just the Liberty Party, it's the Free Soil Party, uh, and eventually the Republican Party by the mid 1850s. And Douglas clearly sees a path. Uh, for abolition in the political arena that Garrison does not. He outgrows his mentor. And they, they, the split between them is pretty bitter because Garrison has been his mentor for a long time. Uh, yeah. So it's personal too. But it's really over this political issue. Is the Constitution pro-slavery or anti-slavery? And why Garrison and Wendell Phillips look at the U.S. Constitution and look at the particular clauses on slavery and can literally look at those words and say, look, these are compromises over slavery. And this is why the constitution is pro-slavery. Douglas does something that is fascinating. He looks more at the spirit of the constitution. You know, he's, look, he's what we would call today a liberal constructionist. You know, he has a progressive view of the constitution. He sees it as a living document. He does yeah. not see that because slaveholders are the ones who are doing the sort of literal reading of the constitution saying it protects slavery, therefore you can't touch it. And Gar Douglas says something fascinating. He says, no, the constitution is actually anti-slavery in spirit. And he starts reading all these political abolitionists like William Goodell and Lysander Spooner, who've been arguing that the Bill of Rights should basically apply to slave enslaved people. Mm -hmm. They're in fact citizens of the United States wrongfully deprived of their liberty. Um, and I think that's a politically wise move on, on, on uh, the part of Douglas. And in the end, he's proven right because that's exactly how slavery comes to an end. It comes to an end because it is abolished by uh, the federal government. But in a way, Garrison was right too. You need three constitutional amendments to literally remake the founders constitution to go from a slaveholding republic to an interracial democracy. So when I looked at this dispute between them, I could see in the way in which abolition progress, how both really had uh, uh, that their understanding in a way 
was correct if you looked at it from one perspective. And if you looked at it from another, you could see how Douglas's point of view was in fact more effective when it came to the 1860s. Um, and by the time they die, they, you know, this is after civil war, after emancipation. Mm -hmm. And you, and when I read Douglas's eulogy on Garrison when he dies, you can see that they actually have come far closer. Um, so it's a, it's a long trajectory. They go, Douglas goes from being a Garrisonian to that bitter split in the 1850s. But by the time you get to the 1860s, 70s, even after that split on continuing the American anti-slavery society or not, um, they, I think by the end of, by the end, they are actually inhabiting similar ground. When I, I, you know, in our exhibit, we, our exhibit was in a small space and we decided to focus on after the Civil War for Douglas's writings instead of before. And, and part of the notion there was people don't tend to look at it as much. And you can definitely see in his speeches and in what he's dealing with, especially after the amendments have been passed, is, you know, kind of this fear that it, it just wasn't enough. The amendments did not do what he had hoped they were going to do. And he starts to see Reconstruction fail and, and he, he lives through all of that. So I can definitely see where they're going to come back together on these issues. And, and I, I had a weird thought and I don't know, you know, I'm not a historian, you are, so I'm going to ask you, was, was there ever any consideration of the notion when, you, when, you, when the Civil War ends and then they have to address this issue of a new constitutional convention? Like, did anyone think that, you know, you almost have to start over? Like you're remaking the country because to some extent, Garrison's right. The, the document is just dripping with horrible inbuilt racism. And when we look at the issues that we currently have in our country, it, it, it never goes away. Um, so, you know, is it, would it have been better to say we just ripped this country in two and now we're going to put it back together? We should start over. Oh, that's a, that's a million dollar question, right? Um, the thing is that 19th century Americans, even the abolitionists, actually, to a certain extent, except perhaps for a few iconoclastic Garrisonians, tended to look at the Constitution and Bible in very reverential terms. Mm -hmm. uh, there was never an idea, even amongst the most radical Republicans, that you would completely scrap the U.S. Constitution, because Americans had come to revere the Constitution, especially the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, right? As such a defining part of American democracy. Um, I am actually writing a book right now on the Civil War and Reconstruction, and I haven't come across any suggestion for right. a new constitutional convention, which is interesting, right? They still wanted to retain that document, but they wanted to remake it. Um, so that, you know, when Bingham, uh, John Bingham, who actually uh, was the, one of the main authors of the 14th Amendment, uh, he says, I'm going to nationalize the Bill of Rights. I'm going to come up with a notion of national citizenship. Uh, wow. the, the Bill of Rights that applies against, um, you know, um, uh, any kind of oppression from the federal government. Now we're gonna nationalize it. State governments, the local level, you can't infringe on people's rights. Um, and I think the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments do go a long way mm -hmm. in uh, actually um, changing uh, the United States from a slaveholders republic uh, yeah. to uh, an interracial democracy. And that's why many people call it, you know, the second American revolution, the second founding, uh, et cetera. Uh, so you don't completely scrap the constitution, but you do come up with these, especially the 14th amendment, which is one of the most adjudicated amendments, it comes yeah. up with this notion of equality uh, before the law uh, for all persons, uh, even though it introduces the word male in the US constitution. Uh, and it comes up with this notion of national birthright citizenship, which is still contested. Yeah. The problem I think has been not that the original constitution was so bad is that many of these amendments are simply not enforced. They were nullified in the South. Right. And rightfully, the South should have lost representation in Congress, according to the um, 14th Amendment for disfranchising African-American men. But, but they did not. They, they, got away with, they got away with flouting that. And the fact that people still today oppose the 14th Amendment, uh, I think Trump wanted to do away with national birthright citizenship with an executive order. This is still contested. Mm -hmm. Or the fact that many of our modern expansion of civil rights, whether it's gay marriage, the right to privacy, or 
equality on the basis of sex, uh, you know, all that comes out of the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, they did in fact rewrite the constitution substantially with those three amendments. Uh, and, and not until the progressive era would you get so many constitutional amendments coming together. Yeah. It's of course really tough to amend the constitution. Uh, yeah. But I think yeah. Americans are very fond of the US constitution. I think it'll be hard to get rid of, uh, it would be like throwing the baby out of the bathwater. I, I think it, there is room for us to, um, to stick with Douglas's notion of the living constitution and mm. let each generation make it anew. Uh, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting because I, I, we haven't had an amendment in a long time and, and political division makes it very difficult at a state level uh, to meet the criteria for an amendment um, I mean, with that, the ERA, you know. Absolutely. Uh, the ERA is a good example of how that failed. But also, if you think about popular election, I mean, they made uh, election, the senator's elections. Yeah. Some states could still, you know, do sort of indirect elections through legislatures. In the progressive era, it's about time we had a popular election for the presidency. <laughs> I still have to explain to people how is it that the person with the most number of votes did not win the presidency <laughs> many times in U.S. history. So yeah. Yeah. it is bizarre. Um, I'm going to uh, switch over to Q&A in just a second. I want to remind everybody, uh, some people have submitted. If you want to submit a question, please just hit the Q&A button and submit your question. Um, I'm going to ask you one more to give everybody a chance, and then we'll start asking questions. But I, you, you brought it up quickly, and, and it's a big part of the book. Um, can you talk a little bit about, as we talk about these amendments too, because that was obviously a, a split point, um, the suffragette movement that was such a huge part of the abolition movement and was so intertwined with it, um, then when we come to the amendments, uh, there's this division, you know, and Douglas was a huge abolitionist or a, a huge suffragette supporter, but still there was that decision that we can't get the amendment for everyone. So it will be for men still, um, kind of, you know, what happened at that point? Yeah. I mean, that's a very interesting moment immediately after the civil war. I mean, Douglas, as you know, was a suffragist. He, he published the, the proceedings of the Seneca Falls convention. In fact, if he hadn't published it, we may not have to have it uh, yeah. today. His newspaper's motto was, you know, um, uh, right is of no color, truth is of no sex. So that represented what I would call intersectional abolitionist feminism fighting simultaneously for black and women's rights. And a lot of abolitionist feminists did that throughout the 1850s. So the split comes not so much between abolitionists and suffragists as it is amongst the women's rights activists themselves. There are some abolitionist feminists um, following Lucy Stone, uh, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Frederick Douglass, who refused to oppose the 14th and 15th Amendment. Uh, they feel that that's the step in the right direction and that we should indeed fight for women's right, a 16th Amendment for women's right to vote. Uh, and there was a point when they had formed an organization, the Equal Rights Association, to yeah. fight simultaneously for black and uh, women's rights. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony decide at that point to oppose those Reconstruction Amendments. And in order to do that, they enter into an expedient alliance with racist Democrats who are seeking to overthrow Reconstruction. And I think that's a bit of a tragedy for the women's movement uh, because they compromise with racism uh, at that point. It is expedient. Um, so, and the suffragist movement divide, we get two different suffrage organizations. They don't come back together until 1890. Uh, so some people think that, oh, the women's movement becomes independent of abolition at this time, but it loses a lot too. It yeah. loses that abolitionist commitment to racial equality. And Democrats, we know, were no suffragists as they were no abolitionists. Right. They used it, they used women's rights as a way to actually undermine federal laws and amendments giving black men certain citizenship rights. Uh, and Antony and Stanton decide to play that game uh, for a long time until the mid 80s, until the early 1870s when they finally realize it's not working. Mm. Uh, but I think that uh, it's a, a tragic legacy for the women's movement uh, in this country to compromise with racism because later on in the 1890s uh, and the early 20th century, as we move towards the 19th amendment, uh, suffragists are more keen on wooing Southern white women into 
uh, their movement and allowing segregated locals uh, rather than fighting for black rights. Because by that time reconstruction is overthrown and, and black people have lost, uh, black men have lost uh, certainly uh, all political rights and black people as a whole, all civil rights. Um, so that, that's a tragic story, I think, uh, of, of the women's movement in this country that we lost that intersectional commitment to both black and women's rights that the abolition movement and that abolitionist feminists uh, represented. Yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, jump into some of the questions we have from our audience. Um, I'm going to remind folks if they want me to let them s ask their question out loud, they should just raise their hand. Um, and if I don't see your hand up, I'm just going to read your question. Uh, so I'm going to read the first one I see here from Francine Shorts, who asked, um, what is uh, your personal connection in choosing this subject matter as your focus? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, so I, I trained as a 19th century U.S. historian, uh, and my first book was on pro-slavery thought and states' rights ideology. So as far from abolition as you can imagine. And uh, uh, my first job it was at the University of Massachusetts, and I really decided I wanted to write a book about people I actually liked after spending a long time with slaveholders uh, and, and secessionists. Uh, and uh, all my sources were here, um, you know, a lot of them in Massachusetts, of course, there's elsewhere too. Uh, but, uh, you know, just the anti-slavery collection in the Boston Public Library is a good place to start. Um, so I thought I'd look at the other side of that ideological extreme, the debate over slavery. So I went from looking at states' rights, pro-slavery writers, secessionists, to looking at abolitionists. Uh, and I, you know, I found much more, as I, as I said earlier, than I thought I would. And I really got into this book in a way that I didn't think I would. Uh, and uh, it took me a long time to do it. It was a labor of love. People kept saying it's too long. No one will read it. And I said, no, I just have to write this book. It became kind of a passion to write it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question here from Jay Tremblay. Um, who wanted to know, um, with the uh, 1619 Project, with the publication of it, uh, there was a strong rebuttal by several academic historians. What advice would you give to lay people as to how to understand the debate? That's a great question, too. You know, um, I think it's really important to remember that history is, is, is contested. You know, uh, we, uh, you know, we come up with our own interpretations and arguments, but we can't come up with our own evidence and facts. Uh, you know, that's the way history sort of lies at the cusp of the social sciences and the humanities. We do need to, to prove our argument. I, I always tell my students that I, I, I don't want to tell them what to think, but I want them to be able to prove uh, their point of view. Uh, you, you cannot say something that has no basis uh, in, in the historical record, uh, in the evidence that we have. And that in, I see a lot of the um, the, the arguments of the 1690 project precisely in that range. Uh, mm. And what I found interesting in terms of the rebuttal to it was that it was not against the 1690 project as a certain version of history that was becoming increasingly written in the last few decades. And a lot of the historians felt uh, that that version of American history was somehow extremely threatening to the interpretations that they had invested their time in. Uh, and I can read the 1619 Project, and I don't say it mainly because, you know, they used uh, one of the articles, uh, used my first book. Um, but I, I say it because I think it's important to be able to look at it and say, yeah, I understand that. I, I'll go along with this. Maybe I won't go as far here, you know, but I, we should read it as any other historical text or document or history written by, uh, you know, um, any history book that we read. But the idea that we should just condemn the entire project because somehow its entire premise is wrong, uh, yeah. which is the reaction that some uh, historians had, I thought was a little wrong headed. Uh, that was not my reaction. Uh, and I certainly think it was not the reaction of, of, of many historians uh, who actually uh, um, found many of the articles uh, a lot to agree with, 
maybe some things that they didn't agree with, but that happens all the time. I mean, when do you read a history book and you agree with every word that the person has written? You know, you, I have a graduate seminar and you read something and you debate it. And I think that's the way the 1619 project should be looked at in, and should be used in the classroom. Uh, I do think it is valuable in terms of just for the broader audience, for the broader public, this is not news to most historians, but for the broader public to understand what a central role uh, slavery and uh, the fight for black citizenship has played in this country's history. It's something that's not normally told in the textbooks. And in that sense, I think it was an important corrective. Uh, and I, I, I think it is, uh, it, it's, it's worth reading and using and debating and, uh, you know, uh, precisely for that reason. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, again, from your book, the, this notion that when you go back to the 1720s and you see what was happening and you realize that this was not something that was in the background and people weren't thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, and yet when we talk about the history of the founding fathers, it, it seems to be very much a footnote. It's that thing that they make a compromise on and just move past to write the constitution. But obviously it was a much larger issue um, and, and was always on the minds of people involved. So yeah, I think that you're right in the sense that a lot of the history that we have has been coded in such a way um, from Southern Reconstruction and, and other things that we just forget that these are the facts and then it was interpreted one way for a very long time. And so, yeah, I mean, this this idea is is really more mytho mythology uh, rather than history, uh, because the idea that you know somehow oh in the 18th century no one's talking about slavery or abolition these were men of their times I don't even know what that means because there were so many abolitionists and many <laughs> of them are actually writing to Washington and Jefferson and talking to them about yeah. abolition and slavery so uh, it, it's right there the historical record you know but people see these things through very rigid ideological lenses. And that's why I think that sometimes you just need to do good history. You need to go yeah. back and read the record and you'll find that abolition was very much in the air in the revolution era. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 at the Smithsonian National uh, African-American Museum, uh, there's a great bit of correspondence between uh, African-American scientist, um, mm -hmm. freed African-American scientist and Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Just like, I don't exactly. understand. Yes. And, and it's just, so yeah, it was there. It was there then. Um, exactly. And African Americans are suing for their freedom. They're, mm -hmm. you know, using revolutionary ideology to fight for their freedom right then. And, and let's not forget that the Northern states abolished slavery at that time. So this is the first abolition in the right. Western world, uh, the creation of the so-called free states of the United States. So yeah, very much that. Um, I'm going to jump into, uh, let me just see if anybody has raised their hand. I don't see it. So I'm going to move on to David's question. Uh, and David asked, uh, the British promised, again, freedom to slaves who fled their masters uh, to take the, uh, their side during the American Revolution. Um, what happened to the slaves that took the losing British side? Did they stay and were punished? Did any migrate to Africa? Did any flee to Canada? Um, were there families that later participated in the Underground Railroad. I think he's just kind of curious what happened to those people. Yeah, great question. Yeah, the story of the Black Loyalists uh, is fascinating. Uh, and um, we know that, of course, uh, many African Americans fought in the continental side, uh, but many also fought on the British side with Lord mm -hmm. Dunmore's proclamation. They were promised their freedom, uh, especially in many of the southern states that refused um, to either recruit slaves or give them their freedom if they fought on the continental side. So the one avenue for freedom was, in fact, to defect to British lines. Um, and to give the British the credit, uh, you know, they stuck by their word. You know, they, when Washington wanted, uh, and many uh, Southerners wanted, uh, and even Northern slaveholders wanted these enslaved people who had fled to British lines returned, uh, the British refused to do that. Uh, and their journey is is amazing. It's been told in some books. I tell it in my book too, uh, the way they go to Canada and then from Canada, they're dispersed literally uh, back um, to uh, Sierra Leone, the British colony mm -hmm. in, in West Africa. 
and uh, some even make their way all the way to Australia, to all corners of the British Empire. Um, the interesting story is that one of these slaves, his name was Harry Washington. Um, you know, some of these slaves were literally fleeing the founding fathers. They were slaves of Madison, Jefferson, Washington. But Harry Washington must have learned a thing or two from George Washington because he actually leads a rebellion <laughs> against British authorities in Sierra Leone. Um, so their, their stories are actually quite, quite fascinating. History is always more interesting than fiction. Yeah. And... Uh, um, yeah, uh, and his rebellions is put is put down in Sierra Leone, but uh, uh, but they they assert their rights within the the British Empire too, even though they were loyalists. Yeah, um, I have another question here from Marcy Sachs, who was wondering if you could share a little bit more about your current project on um, the Civil War and Reconstruction. Thanks, Marcy. Um, yeah, so I'm writing a book on what I call the reconstruction of American democracy after the Civil War. So I'm very much interested in looking at those reconstruction amendments, but I'm also interested in looking at not just the formal period of reconstruction, but looking at the period even after reconstruction, the gradual unwinding of reconstruction um, till the early 20th century uh, and how, um, people contested American democracy, either to expand its boundaries along gender, racial lines, those lines, but how also uh, you had forces trying to prevent that and how they ultimately win. You know, there was a reconstruction of white supremacy, for instance, in this country. There is the conquest of the Plains Indians in the West. Uh, there is, uh, the start of Amer formal American empire uh, in the Pacific and with the uh, Spanish-American war with Cuba and the Philippines. So I'm really interested in looking at all those developments under this broader rubric of the reconstruction of American democracy that will go beyond just the formal reconstruction period that sort of begins with the Civil War and ends in the early 20th century. So I guess I really have become a historian <laughs> of the long 19th century because I went back to the eight, a little bit to the 18th uh -huh. with the Russian book and now I'm going a little bit forward to the 20th with this one. Um, but that's the broad outlines for this book. Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, how far are you from uh, finishing this one? Is this another 10-year project? Uh, no, no. This is a, going to be a shorter book. Um, I want it to be read more widely. I want it out in, um, you know, ad adopted as a text and read broad by the broader public. Wow. Um, and, and many of the themes that I discuss in this book are, are so relevant for our times. Um, so it's a shorter book. It's under contract with Live Right Norton and uh, you know, hopefully you will see it in the in the next year or two, the finished product. So so I've written this book faster than I usually write uh, well, under the, the, uh, the pressure of having a contract. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that on the notion that we will be open again and you can come back and actually be here in this room instead of me alone in this room. <laughs> we can talk about sure. the book. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, um, there are a couple other questions here. Um, uh, Lucian uh, Ferguson has asked, um, he wanted to say thank you, and he wanted to know when the concept of civil rights first become important for abolitionists, and how does it change their conversations and debates? Great question. Um, you know, uh, abolitionists, I, when I was writing the book, I discovered had come up with this idea of human rights. Yeah. Uh, we always think of human rights as a very modern phenomenon. We think of it as a 20th century phenomenon with the UN Declaration of Human Rights. We all talk about human rights now. But clearly abolitionists had this idea where they were no longer just talking about natural rights, which was the way people talked about rights mm -hmm. uh, at that time coming down from, you know, Rousseau and Locke and the Enlightenment and the whole revolutionary Republican heritage. Uh, increasingly, when abolitionists are looking at disfranchised sections of the nation, enslaved people, black people, women, they are talking about human rights. I mean, they have a journal called Human Rights. Yeah. So, uh, and they and they use it constantly. Angelina Grimke uses it in in her uh, uh, famous uh, rejoinder to Catherine Beecher, "Human rights not founded on sex," uh, and uh, other abolitionists use it constantly in their speeches. 
Uh, and then increasingly, I found that amongst African Americans in particular, in their convention movements, when they start reimagining the abolition movement as not just a fight against slavery, but as a fight for black citizenship, increasingly you come across terms of political rights, of suffrage, of enfranchisement, of civil rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see this in abolitionist jurisprudence, um, you know, when they're fighting in fugitive slave cases or whether there are certain state laws being passed to protect uh, African-American rights um, or to um, attempts uh, to win the right to vote. People are increasingly talking about civil rights and political rights. And this, of course, flowers or it reaches its apex during Reconstruction when increasingly you have um, you know, federal laws, the first Civil Rights Act of 1866 before the 14th yeah. Amendment, and then Sumner's famous Civil Rights Act, which of course uh, is deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, but which actually outlaws segregation before the rise of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, so this concept of civil rights and, and civil rights as not just the normal civil rights as the right to own property and sue, et cetera, but civil rights in Sumner's abolitionist expansive terms as the right to access to public spaces and equal accommodations in public transportation. All that I think is a culmination of this sort of long abolitionist fight, not just to end slavery, but also for political and civic equality. Interesting. They, um, have a, a quick question from uh, Lisa, who wants us to repeat the name of the captain of the ship we were talking about. And I think it's Cuff, C-U-F-F-E or something like Paul that? Cuffy. Cuffy. Yeah, Paul Cuffy. Paul Cuffy. And uh, you can actually read his uh, logbook. It's been published. Oh. Uh, and you can, um, yeah, you can even visit uh, Mystic Seaport in Connecticut. Uh, oh and see some, some of the sources around him. He's a fascinating character. He and his brother um, in Massachusetts, they said they, it is in colonial and in the early, but they said, we are not going to pay taxes if we don't have the right to vote. Yeah. You know, they, they, they use the no taxation uh, yeah. uh, without representation uh, quite effectively. So he does a lot of interesting things in terms of fighting for black equality besides this sort of the, the immigration scheme, which he develops in concert with British abolitionists and Black abolitionists and Quaker abolitionists in the U.S. It's, a, it's an abolitionist project, really, uh, of the first wave, yeah. And then um, <clears throat> I have another question here, and I think we should probably make this our last one. Um, so this is from Malcolm, uh, who's actually our founder, who apparently is online watching us from Washington. Um, so Malcolm would like to ask uh, how we should treat the Jefferson's hypocrisy uh, as a slaveholding champion of liberty? That's, uh, oh, it's a loaded question. Um, you know, um, Jefferson is, 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 is a complex character, as, as we all know. And uh, as I was writing uh, this book, I tended to view the founding fathers from the perspective of contemporary abolitionists. Uh, and uh, I saw that um, even though uh, many Southern pro-slavery writers did not like the fact that Jefferson even answered Benjamin Banneker, the black scientist whom you mentioned, yeah. most black abolitionists tended to be Federalists. They liked Washington, they liked Hamilton, they liked um, the Federalists because they tended to protect black rights. Federalists were elitists. They believed in property holding qualifications for voting, but they felt if you were African-American and you met those qualifications, you could go ahead and vote. And a lot of these early black abolitionists like Lemuel Haynes um, uh, and uh, Sidney, um, David Hammond, they were, they, they, can't, they were angry with Jefferson because of his notes on the state of Virginia. Yeah. Rather than looking at his uh, asides against slavery, they felt that everything that he said about race in, that, in those notes would become a powerful argument against uh, black freedom. And in a way they were right because people use racial arguments because if you're founding a republic based on human equality uh, and you make an exception for a certain group of people, you use racist arguments. And um, so a lot of black abolitionists uh, sort of take on Jefferson 
you know, William Hamilton takes him on. He's, he calls him a hypocrite. Uh, and um, so does David Walker. He says, these words having come from Mr. Jefferson, no less a personage than Mr. Jefferson, will be used against us and we need to refute them. Uh, because racism is going to be baked into the DNA of the American Republic when it's leading lights, when a man who, you know, the author of the declaration can speculate on racial inferiority in that manner. So uh, looking at it from the perspective, maybe I had a biased perspective because I'm looking at the abolitionists. On the other hand, of course, uh, it's Jefferson's declaration that Lincoln evokes in order to criticize slavery. So it is a dual, it's a troubled legacy. Uh, but I do think that um, uh, Jefferson's, um, and, and then of course his, his own personal life, you know, it's, it's, it's contradictory. <laughs> his, his relationship with Sally Hemings, which of course Annette Gordon-Reed, um, you know, began. And now we know for a fact through all sorts of evidence that this was indeed uh, the case that he had this longstanding relationship with, uh, um, uh, with Sally Hemings, even though he um, decried it. He decried racial intermingling in, in notes of the state of Virginia. So he is an extremely complex man and to tease those things out has been uh, interesting. But black abolitionists kept responding to Jefferson. Uh, that, that's, that stung them, that, that uh, speculation of inherent racial inferiority is something that they're still answering in the 1850s. Yeah. They're still answering Jefferson. Um, I think, it, you know, it goes to that notion of the documents, you know, the constitution and the declaration of independence are these founding documents that Douglas and others are using as the reasons for why they should be free. And their inherent flaw is, comes from Jefferson um, and, and, and his ilk that are, you know, hypocritical on this issue, but yet you want, you want him to answer in a way because the other things that he says are so important, the, the notion of liberty and freedom. And, and that's something that I would like to really end with, this notion that, that the American democratic project is a contested one. Yeah. That, you know, to either say that it is all this or that really does not capture the nuances or the complexity or the role in which African-Americans themselves have played in pushing at the boundaries of American freedom and democracy. So, you know, as a 19th century historian, I can see that constant contestation. You can see it today. Right. You know, the battles you think that are long fought and won actually have not been won. They're constantly in play, it seems to me. Uh, and that is the dual legacy, the Janus face legacy of American democracy, uh, because in fact, slavery was not uh, an exceptional institution that was eventually done away with. You know, that Whiggish notion that we have of American freedom and democracy as pro progressing in this like linear line towards greater and greater freedom is simply not true if you study American history. You can see all these steps back and forth and, you know, all the contestations and the conflicts at each age. So uh, I think once one understands that history is not simple, mm -hmm. uh, that you always had this, this conflict, that you, know, you get a better sense. So I am not one of those who believe that you know, the you know, simple narratives of American exceptionalism. On the other hand, I, you know, especially somebody who was born and brought up uh, in a country not, not here, you know, coming yeah. as an outsider to the United States, I think the notion that this is all you know, it's it's tainted that it's inherently bad. We yeah. just, I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think that 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 is too simple too for me. Um, I think this notion, I like the notion that we have to keep fighting, uh, as Douglas, the agitator, and yeah. abolitionist found that they had to keep fighting for that, uh, for those progressive values. I think that is a perfect place for us to wind up our conversation. It's been very enjoyable. I have a number of people posting uh, in the question area how much they've enjoyed this. So thank you, thank you. Dr. Sinha, for spending time with us and for talking about this again. Um, and I look forward to your next book.